I said, you know, if somebody actually wrote about what they're going to face, because people don't want to tell cops, look, if you go in and talk about what another cop does wrong, your career could be over. They don't tell new cops that. Uh, I spoke at Evanston um, at Northwestern University just last fall to 30-some police chiefs, and I said, how many of you tell your cops that if you come in and tell the truth about misconduct of another cop, that you will be ostracized, that you will be singled out, and that your career may be over? How many of you tell your young cops that? Nobody, not a single chief would raise their hand. In fact, some of them actually put their heads down. I said, if you don't tell them the truth about that, do you ask them to tell the truth about what they saw? Well, of course, absolutely. <laughs> well, how do you think that's working for you? And they just, you know, nobody said anything. A couple of them said, well, it works great. We don't have a code of silence in our department. I said, yeah. Yeah, well, right. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs>
I documented one death threat that I got while I was on the department. So yeah, it's still there. There's still. Very, I had a former Chicago police lieutenant tell me, had I written this book in Chicago about Chicago PD, they never would have found my body. <laughs> and, and, that's well, without, yeah. and that's without naming names. He said, they never would have found your body. You would have been with Jimmy Hoffa or something. I was going to yeah. say, I know yeah. where Jimmy Hoffa I'd, is. I'd known where, <laughs> I would have known where Jimmy Hoffa was at that point. Yeah. I was, I was <laughs> in Detroit. You'd be shaking with hands with him. <laughs> yeah, was this just, um, was this mostly surrounding the gang strike, cor- strike force unit? Or, or was this happening in other areas? What, the uh, misconduct? The misconduct. Well, I think there's always a certain... Or the cer- defense of it, oh, rather. Yeah, this well, the defense of it goes on all the time. And the, and the problem is, as you're going up through the police department, you make a lot of mistakes your first year. You know, you think about the power and authority a, a young cop has that's 21, 22 years old, maybe not a lot of life experience, and they make a lot of mistakes. And the way they get through a lot of those mistakes is other cops help them out. You either tweak the report a little bit, maybe you do a little creative report writing, and they get so this. This is the good stuff. This is the stuff we want to know. So this is, but this, <laughs> oh, is yeah. how, this is how a lot of cops get through their first year or so. Yeah. I talked to uh, a number of police chiefs. They said, if you had been held strictly accountable for every mistake you made your first year in a job, would you still have a job? And unanimously, they all said no never would have made it but but a good cop figures out that this is not the way to do business and they're told that by good training officers but you, but you have a very small minority of cops that just realize hey I can do whatever I want to do as long as I just good the report writing is right and everything's going the way it's supposed to go for the courts why not but where is the line where do you draw the line what what is a mistake that is that you can't look the other way for I mean it, are there any Oh, there's lots of them, uh, and I think cops have to learn that very, very early in their career. And a good training officer and a good supervisor will make sure they know where that line is. You know, theft is unacceptable. Drinking on a job is unacceptable. Uh, prostitution on a job is uh, unacceptable. At least uh, seem like these don't seem like rookie mistakes that you're listing. No, but think of the number of cops that go to jail every year for all of those things. I yeah. mean, they're still happening out there. But it's not, it's not, they're not really going to jail, are they? No. Oh, yeah, but if you look online, Andy, look at the, look at online and go, just type in Google in uh, police sentenced to or police imprisoned for, and you will get thousands and thousands of hits. There's been over 12,000 officers decertified across the United States just in the last few years for crimes they committed on the job, which means they will never ever be a police officer again in any state. So a lot of them are being prosecuted and a lot of them are being charged and, and put away. The problem is it's it's very difficult if other cops will cover for them and say, you know, hey, I didn't see what happened or no, I'll you lie, I'll swear to it, that sort of thing. And that does happen. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, when we read in the paper about how many police officers cannot be convicted. I mean, juries won't convict. Judges uh, sort of let them off the hook, it's am- even when prosecutors have the guts to go after them. It's amazing. If you go back in Minneapolis just to the, the Dave Niebuhr uh, group. Oh, that, Dave Niebuhr, that's and that right. Group, yeah, and, that's a, and that name goes back for those of us that have been around a while. But you look, at one point they were caught in perjury in court, perjured themselves in court in a decoy case. And they got what some days off and Dave Niebuhr ended up being put in then later on being put in charge of internal affairs after it was his unit that perjured themselves in court <laughs> and got days off for it. I mean it's just it's nuts and uh, you look at the number of cops that have been caught in perjury across the United States how many of them have been charged with perjury I I'll, I'll guarantee you it's almost nobody and you're right and they don't they don't prosecute them. and I, I so that's one of the reasons for your book all right. Well, th- we're gonna. I want to expand this conversation a little bit to, uh, t- to the other things. But what? Tell tell the audience uh, because I, uh, I skimmed through this book and I didn't s- exactly see where you expanded and and uh, updated the book. So tell me what you did. What well, one of the things I did when I f- when the book first came out, I wrote about a guy, uh, Stephen Avery, out of Wisconsin, who was convicted of a. a brutal rape that he never committed and he did I think it was 17 years in prison and so he was kind of a uh, one of the guys that was always brought up that when they talked about 
uh, people that have been exonerated by DNA because he was in prison for all these years while the real convict was out there committing more rapes. Stephen Avery gets out of prison, wins this huge award, and then uh, is convicted of, a, of a, just a horrifying uh, rape, uh, torture, and murder of Teresa Halbach. And it's clear that he did it. I mean, as a, he even got his own nephew to participate in the rape uh, as part of it. And so here I, I had to update that. You know, here I talked about <laughs> Stephen Avery as being somebody that did that. And I did talk about it, and I brought up the fact that was it right, was it wrong to release him? No, because we convicted him, we convicted him wrongly of the wrong crime. Should Stephen Avery have been in prison? Yes, but you've got to do it by the book. You've got to do it right. Mm -hmm. uh, then I updated the statistics on officers killed, and I also added the columns that I'd written. I wrote uh, ethics columns for officer.com for two years, and I added a number of those uh, columns to the book because I'd received some really neat emails from cops over the years uh, saying, one of them in particular was about a cop who said, you know, I was ready to quit my career. I thought my career was over. I couldn't do this anymore. I read your column, and it just happened to come to me that day as I was reading it on the, on the website. And he said, I, I remembered why I was doing this job. And I went back to work with as a changed, per, changed person. So That's good. Those sort of stories. And you have to hope that that's the kind of thing that will happen. And I'm get, I get emails from the United States, from across Canada. Uh, I got a really great email from West Virginia. Three officers sued their own department. And I had no, no idea this was going on. They sued their own department for mismanagement, for keeping these cops on the job that were brutal and lying. They sued their own department and they won. They got rid of the cops, they got rid of their chief, they got a new policy manual. And they called me just to tell me, I want you to know we did this and we used your book as part of what we did to get this done. This for writing this book was really the mistakes I made, the mistakes I saw other cops make, the cops that went to prison over the years, cops that lost their careers, their wives, their families over the years. I said, you know, if somebody actually wrote about what they're going to face, because people don't want to tell cops, look, if you go in and talk about what another cop does wrong, your career could be over. They don't tell new cops that. Uh, I spoke at Evanston um, at Northwestern University just last fall to 30-some police chiefs, and I said, how many of you tell your cops that if you come in and tell the truth about misconduct of another cop, that you will be ostracized, that you will be singled out, and that your career may be over. How many of you tell your young cops that? Nobody. Not a single chief would raise their hand. In fact, some of them actually put their heads down. I said, if you don't tell them the truth about that, do you ask them to tell the truth about what they saw? Well, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> well, how do you think that's working for you? And they just, you know, nobody said anything. A couple of them said, well, it works great. We don't have a code of silence in our department. I said, yeah. Well, yeah, right. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> was it? How removed are you but, from your but anyway, rank to, and file? To get back to it, I, you know, I made a lot of mistakes as a young cop. Uh, one of the most common ones is you, I had one guy that said, one training officer said, look, there's a known narcotics dealer. Cool. I jumped out of the car instantly, grabbed this guy, patted him down, found some dope on him, found a weapon on him. And I was all excited. Here I got dope and a weapon off this non-narcotics dealer. And I get it, my partner finally gets out of the car and he says, so why'd you search this guy? <laughs> well, you said he was a non-narcotics dealer. He says, you know, didn't they, you gotta have more than that. Where's your probable cause? So he says, look, we got two choices. We let the guy walk away. We take his gun, take his dope, inventory it, charge him, write him up as, you know, as an, an arrest, was a felony arrest, that he's never going to charge him if we tell the truth about what we did. And I said, well, we got the gun and the dope. And he said, I think that's a good choice. We got the gun and the dope. We'll arrest him and we'll let the county attorney decide based on what we did whether or not it's a good arrest. And we did. And they let him walk. They didn't charge him. Mike, but we, how, how but we did get the gun and the dope up.